Hello everyone, Dr. Stillman here, and today we are re-recording the video I dropped last week on the hidden effects of toxins in first responders and veterans in honor of 9-11. You can learn more about this in my book, Dying to be Free. There is a link to that in my link tree. And without further ado, let's jump into what we're going to cover today. So I wanted to make this video because I think that a lot of people, specifically men and women who are first responders, active duty military, and obviously veterans do not understand the role that heavy metals and other environmental toxins are playing in their health and disease. And we actually have a really interesting case study in this from the uh, people who cleaned up and responded to the disaster at the World Trade Center on 9-11 many years ago. What we find in these people is that they had very, very elevated levels of toxins, and we're going to talk about which toxins and why they matter in a moment. And we also have a blueprint or game plan for how we can improve or help these people to detoxify these things and therefore improve their health and their longevity, which is what this paper really starts with. So this is about organic pollutants in 9-11 World Trade Center rescue workers and their reduction following detoxification. So one thing for people to understand about your exposure to chemicals in our modern environment, and while this video is specific to first responders, vets, blue collar workers who have these in an occupational setting, what I want you to understand if you're sitting at home and you're a stay at home mom, you're a retiree, there are other elements in your environment that are common to them that you are still exposed to that are your exposure route. And even though we see accelerated effects in people who are occupationally exposed, as in they get sick in a matter of months or years, what we see in the general public is that these exposures lead to illnesses over days, weeks, months, years, even decades. Okay. So what are some of the things that are, that were components of the environmental and health disaster at ground zero on September 11th, there was ultra fine particulates. All of you are breathing these in. It's why I'm a big fan of air filters. It's why I'm a big fan of having a great HVAC system on your home. It's why I'm a big fan of living in a place where there's just generally speaking a very high air quality. If you're living in a place such as a moldy home or a severely polluted city or town or county, you're just asking to take years off of your life. High temperature conditions or high temperature combustion, one of the things that happens when we heat things is they combust and they create new chemicals. And this played a really critical role in why first responders to ground zero, as well as firefighters, veterans, et cetera, have worse exposures and worse outcomes with many illnesses than the general population. And then also this was a months long process. Things were still coming out, pollutants were still coming out of this disaster area even months after uh, the event, okay? So one of the things we found in first responders to 9-11 is that they developed symptoms that remained unresolved with time. Some of this may, and uh, I believe was, due to the effects of things we call polychlorinated biphenyls, polychlorinated dibenzofurans, and polychlorinated dioxins, okay? And that's what they measured in this study. One of the things I want you to know about these chemicals and other chemicals like them is that it's very hard to measure chemicals in the general public. You can't go to your regular doctor and say, hi, I'd like you to tell me what my total toxic load is, what my allostatic load is, what my body burden of toxic chemicals is. Why? These are, as we're, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but there's tons and tons and tons of these different chemicals and testing for all of them is extremely difficult and complicated. And even though I've looked through the lab testing world, I still don't have sources that I really trust for these things. It's part of why I use predominantly hair tissue mineral analysis in my practice. That's the method I've found most robust for understanding someone's total toxic burden. We're going to cover a study on that in a moment. So what these uh, people in this study did was they looked at these workers, they found that they had all these persistent coughs, headaches, memory disturbances, other symptoms. These are bread and butter problems that I see in my patients. They're complaining of these as their top priorities. How can I stop coughing? How can I get rid of my headaches? How can I get my memory back? And on and on. There were very high levels of these toxic chemicals like benzene, dioxins, polychlorinated biphenyls um, at ground zero. That's why they did this study. Um, and what did they do? 
they checked and they they converted these into total um, to dioxin toxic equivalents, which is basically like saying we're going to take all these very different chemicals and we're going to sort of lump them into a category and come up with a basic way of thinking about them as a total toxic load. Then they treated a number of the people who came to them, these workers, uh, with a you know integrative holistic detoxification regimen developed by this guy named Hubbard. The details of which I won't get into. I use similar things in my medical practice to help people deal with these and other issues. This is really what integrated medicine is about. And I'll talk more about you know some of the key things that I think work uh, as we go through these papers. So what did they find? I'm going to skip ahead to the most compelling part of this paper. They found that when they went through this detoxification program, the workers had significant drops in these toxic chemicals. Okay. Now, one of the key questions to ask is, are the toxic chemicals dropping because of time and the natural process of the body and the natural healing properties of the body, or are they dropping because of your therapy, right? We often attribute to the medicine what we ought to attribute to placebo. I'm very mindful of that because there's a lot of placebo being gamed in the medical world now and forever. Here's what you see in the people who underwent treatment and who did not undergo treatment. So change before treatment is in the gray. You'll see that some of these people got worse. Change following treatment. You'll see that they almost all got better. In fact, all of them did. So clearly the therapeutic protocol is doing something positive to drop total body loads of these toxins. Okay. This is just another, another paper showing pre-detox levels and post-detox levels of different chemical compounds in these people's bodies. Why is this so important? Well, look at these respiratory or these, excuse me, systematic complaints. This is the before in the gray, the severity of the complaint and the mean symptom scores, right? Is the technical term. And then after, so you have these very high symptom burdens and then boom, after the treatment, you have these low symptom burdens. And we may surmise that if you keep treating and keep going, you're going to see the symptom burden continue to de decline, right? This is a big deal because when you look at the laundry list of complaints of people who are first responders, veterans, et cetera, uh, and in this case, specifically the people who responded to the catastrophe at 9-11, uh, you'll find that these, po these complaints are more and more complaints of the general public. I can't focus. I can't sleep. I can't calm down. I can't relax. I feel depressed. I feel anxious. I have a cough. I have a tickle in my throat. I... Um, can't stop thinking about this or that. I have obsessive compulsive thoughts. I have muscle pain. I have joint pain. I have problems, you know, controlling my muscles, arms, limbs, nerves, whatever. I have eye problems. I have GI problems or digestive problems. I've got immunological issues like allergies and autoimmunity and whatever. And what you'll see when you get people living a healthy lifestyle and eating a healthy diet and using certain modalities from integrative medicine is that these problems get better. And the sad thing is that when you look at studies of these modalities, they're very rarely more than what you're seeing here because there's not an interest in the academic world on this. And even if there is, there's not the funding for these studies. And so this is really like sort of the best of the best in the integrative medicine world for actually documenting the power of what doctors like myself and others do. But, you know, we work off of this and in our private practices, we find that there's really a lot of value for patients in these approaches. And that's why we continue to use them. So the bottom line here, huge, huge loads of these toxic chemicals in these first responders. I guarantee if you replicated this in active duty military veterans, other people who'd had these exposures to high levels of combustion, heat, toxic chemicals, all mixed together, you'd find the exact same thing. Second paper by a guy named Kamu Kokai, Dr. Kokai, I actually know, uh, not directly or personally, but I know him indirectly. He was actually my mother's doctor when she was still in New York City. He came up with this very interesting study protocol where they used chelation therapy, which is something that's been investigated on and off in the conventional medical world for the treatment of cardiovascular disease over the years. And they looked at the total body burden of these gentlemen or first responders with, um, in terms of their heavy metal burden. And then they looked at what happened when they gave them chelation therapy. So most of the individuals they saw had eight or more serious health complaints, respiratory problems, digestive problems, skin rashes, sleeplessness, anxiety, depression, weight gain, elevated blood pressure, lethargy, and recurrent headaches. Again, things I see every single day in my practice and that my patients are very serious about getting under control. 
Heavy metal toxicity was suspected as a causal factor for many of these symptoms. Of those tested for heavy metal toxicity, using a challenge urine test, 85% had excessively high levels of lead and mercury. Chelation treatment using DMSA uh, was the primary treatment. Three to four months of treatment, the first cohort of individuals, 100 individuals, reported significant greater than 60% improvement. They didn't have a similar um, control uh, to the prior study that I mentioned where they looked at, you know, those without treatment, those with treatment, investigating whether or not this might be placebo or the effects of the natural bodies or the body's natural regenerative um, process, right? But it's still a nice, nice outcome. Some of the things they pointed out in this paper really stuck out to me. And I want people to think about this because there's actually industrial and um, just run of the mill activities of human life going on around you where you're being exposed to these things, even if you're not at a disaster area or a Superfund site that's really hopelessly contaminated with toxic chemicals. So at ground zero, 200,000 to 400,000 pounds of lead from personal computers and other computing equipment. This is not to mention the other trace elements that you find in personal electronics. Vaporized mercury from over 500,000 fluorescent light bulbs. That might, they're not, it might not be a lot of mercury per light bulb, but that is a huge number of light bulbs. High levels of dioxins created when plastics combust with copper. Very interesting. I didn't know until I read this paper that that was a, a byproduct of the combustion of plastics and copper. 130,000 gallons of oil and insulating fluid loaded with who knows what else. Asbestos and then jet fuel. Huge, huge um, toxic load and toxic burden and all these things. All of them are heavily toxic. We're going to go over a little bit more about mercury poisoning later, which I think is an interesting and important topic for you to know about. Um, but anyway, okay. One of the earliest reports of toxicity is a report by the Associated Press in January 2002 of Port Authority firefighters. All of them had high levels of mercury toxicity. The suspicion that many symptoms diagnosed as PTSD might be related to mercury toxicity was voiced by a New York City therapist at the time as early as March in 2002. This is a very interesting um, chicken or the egg problem that we find in, in practice is that you're wondering, is the patient sick because of some kind of toxic exposure and accumulation of toxins in the body in terms of how their mind is working? Or are they sick because they have a genuine psychological or psychosocial issue that has to be um, addressed? Either way, you want to be treating holistically, in my opinion, and helping them understand all the different things that might help them. So what did they do? Uh, they began uh, therapy with chelation. Uh, they used a bunch of other things as well, acupuncture, body work, IV vitamins and minerals, sound healing, infrared sauna. 60% saw a significant improvement to, in all of the major health complaints presented at the outset. As they began to improve and feel stronger, psychological issues began to emerge. You will see that in patients when you start to get them healthier with all these physical things, acupuncture, body work, IV, uh, nutrition, et cetera a lot of the time they start to have new feelings, new sensations, new emotions, and actually processing old, old issues and feeling better uh, overall, not only on a physical level, but on a psychological level. They used, um, as I mentioned, intravenous nutrition. They used glandulars. They used, I mean, tons of different modalities. I won't even get into this because there's a lot going on here. But what is the point of this paper and why did I want to share it with you? It's clear that there's a lot of value in these modalities for helping people to detoxify and purify their body. Even if you weren't exposed to some kind of disaster, you're exposed to these chemicals and dangerous compounds in daily life. So it behooves you to understand how to use natural methods in order to purify your body of these things. One of the things that's tough for me to watch as a clinician is for people who are, um, you know, they, they work a blue collar job, firefighter, first responder, police, veteran, uh, uh, active duty military, they can't afford tons of fancy, expensive functional medicine care. And they often don't realize because nobody tells them that if they just spend 20 to 30 minutes in the sauna multiple times a week, it may be the single most important thing that they could do for their overall health and well being. more on sauna in a moment. But I just want people to understand there's a lot of things that you can do to protect yourself and help detoxify your body that a lot of people are leaving just totally undone while they're out there chasing things that are either difficult to afford or that they just flat out can't afford or that don't matter and don't work as well as some of the simple low-hanging fruit.
So on that note, let's talk about one of the things that I think is really grossly underappreciated in our environment as a cause of chronic disease, and that's heavy metals. If you haven't looked at my information and my, my work on, on this topic, you can look back through my YouTube videos. I've got some videos on copper. I've got some videos that we just did one last week on copper toxicity. That was actually now it's two weeks ago. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, on copper toxicity that I think is very important for people to check out. I use copper in my daily practice all the time, particularly with things like the LifeWave patches. Again, I've done videos on that as well. I recommend you check it out. Um, but also check out my HTMA video with Clark Engelbert where we go into this topic in detail and we talk about how important minerals and metals are and how they interact. So heavy metals pound for pound are the most toxic things on planet Earth. And you'll notice in the literature I just reviewed, that there was a massive exposure to these heavy metals, for example, mercury in fluorescent light bulbs, for example, lead and other trace elements in personal electronics. And that I believe is one of the big things that people, uh, first responders, veterans, active duty military are dealing with and are contributing most to their illness uh, and disease in our modern world. One of the best ways to get rid of these things is actually sweat. So I like the way that they start this review. No person is without some level of toxic metals in their bodies circulating and accumulating with acute and chronic lifetime exposures. An individual may take numerous measures to minimize exposures and to optimize metabolism and excretion of toxic elements in the stu stool and the urine with diet supplements and chelation. However, an often overlooked route of excretion of toxicants is via the process of sweating. Okay. They say often overlooked, and that's a polite way of saying that most clinicians do not adequately counsel their patients on the benefits of sauna therapy, which are not in dispute for the record. Although signs and symptoms of chronic disease are consistent with effects of arsenic, cadmium, lead, and or mercury, physicians commonly have a low index of clinical suspicion, and therefore levels of toxic elements are seldom investigated. Translation, all chronic disease may be the result of chronic low level sublethal exposure to these heavy metals, which then displace minerals that you need to run vital physiological processes. However, doctors haven't been taught to think that way. And so they don't look into them. Okay. Diagnosis may be challenging because multiple chemicals may contribute to subtle effects in chronic illnesses of an individual and the effects may be synergistic translation. This can be missed because doctors think about diagnoses in terms of do, does it fit into all the different uh, uh, categories or, or criteria for the diagnosis. But the reality is that what's really important is the underlying physiologic process. Are metals, other toxins in the environment, stresses, things like that, causing a metabolic dysfunction within the body, which results in a disease? The other thing is that these effects are synergistic, right? So you give one person, say, an exposure to mercury, you give somebody else an exposure to less mercury, but also lead, they get the same illness because the mercury and the lead work together to create the same clinical picture. This is a poor example because it's very, it's just sort of academic, but the reality is the same. No two patients are alike. And this really, I think, confuses clinicians who then don't actually look for the root causes of disease. They just say, okay, they fit the diagnostic criteria for X. Here's my treatment algorithm for X. And then they go from there rather than trying to fo focus on the wellness of the patient. How do I get them? Well, what are the diet and lifestyle mistakes they're making and how could those be contributing to something like heavy metal toxicity and accumulation? I'll give you chapter and verse on this from my own practice, uh, as we go. Okay. Some other interesting facts that I found out in this paper that I think you will appreciate are, where are we? Okay. Arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. Those are, for the record, four of the top toxic metals that we deal with in our modern world. I would suggest that aluminum should be lumped into this group. Aluminum is very toxic. Its toxicity is grossly underappreciated by most clinicians and scientists. Um, the work of Christopher Exley is basically the leading work on this. But anyway, these four can be excreted in appreciable quantities through the skin and rates of excretion were reported to match or even exceed urinary excretion in a 24 hour period. This is incredibly important for two reasons. One, it means that you can use sweat in order to massively accelerate the process of detoxification of your body. 
Number two, it means that even in a patient who has compromised kidney function, you can use the skin to help them detoxify. And that's why one of the first things I'll do at the first sign of kidney dysfunction in a patient is say, are you sauna-ing on a regular basis? Are you sweating on a regular basis? And if you're not, how can we get you doing that in some way so that we can access this detoxification pathway, okay? Sweat contains metals not only from the blood plasma, but also evidently originating from dermal layers. What does that mean? It means that the sweat is not just purifying the blood. It's actually purifying one of the largest organs in the body, which is the skin. You've probably heard that before. The skin is the largest organ in the body. Regardless of how you want to define the skin, and you know whether or not we want to argue about if it's the largest organ in the body or not, there is a huge proportion of your biomass in your skin. And it stands to reason that a lot of your toxic exposures wind up in the skin or in the subcutaneous fat, the fat beneath the skin. So wouldn't it be great if we could push blood into those regions to then, and then also activate detoxification through the sweat glands in those areas in that entire organ at once to push those toxins out. And this is why you'll get stories like Brian Richards at Sauna Space, where he talks about how he got into building saunas because he started to use a sauna himself to improve his health when he was feeling unwell. I encourage you to check out my interview with Brian Richards on sauna on my YouTube channel. You can find it there. It's also on my podcast. Check it out. Um, we go into all the science behind sauna, how to use it, and you can get a discount on the sauna space saunas with code Stillman5. It is the sauna that I use, and I use it every day when I, when I can, and then at least three times a week uh, regardless. Okay. It would appear that large variabilities in measured concentrations, apart from collection methods, as mentioned above, were likely the result of differences in excretion amongst widely varying individuals with ranges of body burdens, genetic polymorphisms affecting detoxification efficiency, and, and physiological states, coupled with necessarily crude if simple experimental techniques. Why is that important, even though it sounds like Greek to a lot of you? The translation for this is simple. When you measure the sweat of different people, as they did in these studies, you'll find very different levels and concentrations of toxic metals. This agrees with what you see when you start to measure toxic levels in the hair, which is what I use because it is less variable day to day because the hair is a slower growing tissue. Um, for the record, if I didn't, I, did, I think I mentioned this, but check out the HTMA uh, webinar that Clark Engelbert and I did. I think it's called Cracking the Code, Unlocking the Secrets of HTMA. If you just put in HTMA in, my, in Stillman, you'll probably find it. So the point with this is very simple. You're going to see huge differences in the amount of heavy metals excreted by different people based upon their unique context. And this is why I said before, no two patients are the same. And it's very important to take every patient as an N of one, as a unique person with unique exposures, unique genetics, unique diet and lifestyle factors, and assuming that they're all the same, they're all fine, this is not a problem, and any of them is a big mistake that many people make, which is why I'm very careful to say, look, you're going to see different levels in your blood and your urine and even your hair of toxic elements or minerals, let alone other toxins, because of day-to-day -day variability and week-to-week -week variability. What's clear here is that the sweat is a great tool to detoxify the body, and that must be appreciated. Okay, another thing that I thought was interesting about this is this observation that between a third and a half of lead in sweat may be associated with high molecular weight molecules. What does that mean? They're big molecules that are coming out in the sweat with the lead. They say this should be replicated to make sure that it's not just kind of art artifact of the studies that have been done on it and they should look at other toxic elements coming out in the skin. But what it suggests, or they say it suggests here, is that sweating may be a means of excretion of metals complexed with natural or synthetic chelating agents. There is so much more work to be done on this topic, it's not even funny. Uh, but the point here is simple. Lots of other things are coming out in your sweat, and we may be able to manipulate how much someone gets rid of in their sweat by changing what they are taking in. You know, for example, they also comment on this in the next paragraph, right? So they look at, at this study in particular where they demonstrated a, a ratio um, uh, and increased vitamin E levels in skin secretions. And they, and they note that the vitamin E, zinc, and other nutrients 
could be increasing or improving the ability of the body to detoxify. Again, this is why when I'm looking at a patient or I'm trying to help somebody, a patient, I'm looking at their whole diet, their whole lifestyle and optimizing that their supplements, et cetera, so that the detoxification process can be as robust as possible. It has been noted that among people whose health is compromised by toxicants, heat regulatory mechanisms of the autonomic nervous system are often affected, resulting in a failure to sweat readily. This is a big red flag that a lot of integrative clinicians are aware of. If the patient can't sweat, there may be dysfunction within the autonomic nervous system caused by a total toxic load. And this makes sauna therapy that much more important in these people. And they may say to you, well, I feel like I'm not getting a lot out of sauna because I'm not sweating. No, no, no. You need to double down on your diet, double down on your lifestyle, get your body sweating because you really have a much bigger problem than you may appreciate. And sauna is part of the solution. Clinical experience is that with persistence and ample hydration, patients do eventually start to sweat. That's without a doubt the truth. And this is often a sign that the autonomic nervous system function is beginning to improve. I absolutely agree with that. As this detoxification progresses and is facilitated, this can result in significant clinical improvement. Okay, next paper. So one of the things I want you to understand is that everyone agrees that sauna therapy is good for people. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're way out in the left field of the integrative natural health space, or if you're, you know, sitting in a, you know, professorship, special magical chair at some brand name medical institution. I don't think you'll find a competent wellness or medical professional out there in the world who disagrees with the statement that sauna therapy is good for people. What's important to understand is that I don't think most people understand why it is so good for people. And I think that's still a matter uh, that's open for debate. Um, if your reason for watching this was to understand what's really important, well, let me break it down. It's the sauna therapy. If you don't have a sauna, I strongly recommend you get one. That's why I have the sauna space uh, myself personally. It's why I recommend it to patients. It's why I have a discount code that's still in five to get you a good deal on a sauna. So how do we know that sauna and how big of a deal is this benefit from sauna? Okay. So it's a really a significant, it's significant enough that it actually impacts your overall risk of death. We're going to talk about this study in two papers. It's called the QOPO ischemic heart disease study. They took thousands of men in the prime age, age range for cardiovascular disease. They looked at their high sensitivity CRP, which I did a podcast on last week. This is a measurement of the general over, overall inflammation in the body and is one of our best predictors of cardiovascular events, strokes, heart attacks, et cetera. They characterized this as either high or uh, normal, and they found that the men who have the, uh, and they, they then stratified by frequency of sauna bathing. So there's low and high frequency of sauna bathing. Low is less than or equal to two per week, and high is three to seven sessions per week. And what they find is comparing high versus low frequency of sauna bathing, the hazard ratio for all cause mortality was 0 0.86. So that's a, actually a, even if you don't understand hazard ratios, that is a massive reduction in your all cause mortality just with three to seven sessions per week. Now, what constitutes a sauna bathing session? Listen to my podcast with Brian Richards. We talked about this in detail. Um, the short version is basically, or my rule of thumb for patients anyway, is 20 minutes or until you feel subjectively exhausted and you want to quit. Uh, I don't think there's much uh, data to say that it's lo that longer than that gives us a lot of benefit, although I would take that on a case-to-case -case, um, uh, basis. So frequent sauna bathing actually in, uh, appears to offset the increased all-cause mortality risk related to the high sensitivity CRP. What that means is even if you've got a lot of inflammation in your body, if you sauna, you're going to drop your risk of death. Um, that's related to that high sensitivity CRP being off. Now, is this a chicken or the egg thing? Is the sauna going to help correct the high sensitivity CRP? I would argue that the answer is yes. But even if it doesn't, the sauna bathing is really good for you. Now, a real good question is why is sauna bathing so good for you? This is a, you know, a, a paper from the Mayo Clinic where they talk about all the different reasons that this may be beneficial. I find their review of the evidence to be lacking a very important component, a very important question, which is the effects or the contributions of toxins such as heavy metals to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. They go through all these nitty gritty pathways and, you know, mechanisms of action and biomarkers that are of interest to cardiologists that just make my eyes glaze over because fundamentally they're not looking at the things that I look at. 
what is the nutritional status of the patient? What are their macros? How much are they eating of different minerals? How much are they eating of different vitamins? How much time are they spending outside? How, how much are they sleeping at night? Those are the things that actually move the needle on people's wellness that actually matter to helping them feel and look the way they want to feel and look rather than just, you know, getting lost in these, these, uh, pathways and biochemical, uh, models. I'm frankly kind of flabbergasted that they don't even mention heavy metals in here because I think the elimination of heavy metals from the sweat is a really big deal. I mean, that's what this entire, um, paper is about and how powerfully the sweat can be used and sauna can be used in order to get rid of these heavy metals. Why do I think that's so important? And this, by the way, I, I pulled this paper out because this is, you know, a classic example of where the experts don't mention a really important concept from the foundational medical literature as having a critical role in the phenomenon that they're commenting on. Um, the next paper I want to talk about is why I think inorganic elements or rather heavy metals are so important for overall health and well-being. They are the most toxic substances in the world. The lethal dose of mercuric chloride is between 10 to 42 milligrams per kilogram for a 70, count, pounded, 70 kilo adult. That's estimated. Now, on the low end, 10 milligrams per 70 kilograms, if I'm a 70 kilogram adult, right, 10 times um, 70 is only 700 milligrams. 42 times uh, 70 right? What would that be? 2,800 milligrams. We're talking about less than five grams. Five grams is how much creatine I add to my morning protein shake. And I could fit five grams of creatine, you know, on my thumb. I could probably fit, you know, uh, 70 or 700 or 2,800, whatever the math works out to be. I could probably fit a lethal dose of mercury on the end of my thumbnail, which is pretty amazing when you stop to think about it because that's the amount of mercury you might find in someone's teeth, just in their mercury amalgams. Uh, you will see if you look into the environmental literature that there's tons and tons of routes of exposure to this. And even though there are tiny exposures over time, it's accumulating in the human body. And the accumulation of metals, whether they're toxic heavy metals or they're even nutritive elements like iron, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, plays a critical role in health and wellness because of how they affect reduction in oxidation in the cell and how they create or mitigate oxidative stress. Okay. One of the really interesting things about the QPO's heart start study is they actually published some findings, uh, th that really confirm what I'm telling you here about the importance of these heavy metals to overall health and well-being. So again, QPO heart, heart disease study, the, the same population of people, they found that men in the highest third of hair mercury content had an adjusted 1.6 fold risk of acute coronary event, translation, heart attack, 1.68 fold risk of cardiovascular disease in general, 1.56 fold risk of congestive heart disease, and 1.38 fold risk of any death compared with men in the lower two thirds. Translation, the higher your hair mercury level, the higher your risk of death. I think that's pretty profound. And yet a therapeutic modality that causes your body to sweat out heavy metals like mercury or ex eliminate them in a very powerful way, a definitive review paper on it doesn't even mention this mechanism of action. I find that remarkable. Okay. What's the practical application of this? It is, it behooves you to minimize your exposure to these heavy metals. How do you do that? You minimize your consumption of mercury rich fish, but in a world where mercury has been spewed out into the atmosphere by generations and generations of people, and where uh, we live in a world where these uh, elements and toxic elements are sometimes even in our food, even in our water, even in our medications, there's actual drug classes that are contaminated with mercury, big ones, important ones that mi millions and millions of people are taking. It is important for you to understand not only to mitigate and minimize your exposure, but also to accelerate every mechanism your body has of getting rid of these things because they're just ubiquitous in the environment. And even if you don't eat mercury rich fish, you can wind up with a toxic total body burden of mercury. I would also suggest that it's worthwhile to work with somebody like me to help your, help you understand 
how are your detoxification pathways working? What we'll typically see when, when we take on a case is that the heavy metal levels, let alone other toxins, are at a baseline level, low level at the beginning. And then as we turn on detoxification within the body with sauna and nutrition and diet and lifestyle, things like that, the toxic levels actually go up. And we believe, and you know, we have every reason to believe this, this is because we're actually provoking them out of these tissues and getting the body to eliminate them. And as we do that, we generally see patients feel much, much, much better. They may feel worse, right? But then once those things are cleared and you see the levels drop again in hair or urine or whatever other uh, method you're using to, to examine them, you see then people feel better. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about. Uh, and bringing this back to first responders, veterans, and active duty military, which is the primary people I'm making this video for. One of the things that people really miss is the role of iron in this whole study. I'm going to be lecturing on this in Australia in early November. And I lectured on this at the US and I Price Foundation Wise Traditions Conference in October of last year, 2022. And what I want people to know about iron, and the reason this is so important for the people I'm talking to in this video is that many men don't understand that they're actually at risk for high body burdens of iron that are creating excess oxidative stress and driving a lot of their problems. Funnily enough, the blood, because it's a fluid in the body we can access, it's one of the uh, uh, ways that you can actually remove toxic elements from the body, the primary one of which is iron you lose 225 to 250 milligrams of iron with each unit of blood that you donate. And for those of you who don't know, I wrote about this a lot in my book, Dying to Be Free. I talk about it a fair amount on social media, but here's the bottom line. We think based upon an abundance of literature in the, in the iron, uh, uh, iron health literature, I don't know what else to call it, that men tend to accumulate iron faster than women. And that's the whole point of this paper. This was, this is an old paper, but it's, I pulled it cause it's the first, uh, mention of this in the literature as the hypothesis, the iron and heart disease hypothesis proposed by Jerome Sullivan. He pointed out that women have a much lower risk of heart disease than men in Western society. This normalizes after menopause as in women and men have the same heart disease risk as the, as the women move away from menopause, which suggests that the monthly loss of iron in a woman's menstrual cycle is protecting her from heart disease. This is bad news for anybody who wants to prescribe hormonal birth control because it implies that we're creating iron overload in women that may have untoward consequences. I would suggest this is why modern women have never been less well. But this is one of the really tough things about metals and minerals is that small changes in daily or monthly, let alone yearly uh, levels are not going to be noticeable to you in a significant way. You're not going to notice, uh, for example, that you had a high dose of mercury in your diet last week because you had canned tuna fish. You're not going to notice uh, that maybe the coffee or the tea or the uh, chocolate you're eating is high in cadmium or lead because it's not a high enough dose to cause symptoms. It's not giving you acute poisoning, right? But over time, if you're eating or exposed to some level of, of contamination in the environment, right, it's going to create problems. That's why sauna, I believe, is so powerful. It helps eliminate these toxins from the body while also upregulating all the good things that they are talking about in that Mayo Clinic Proceedings article that I quoted earlier. Right. I'm not saying those guys are wrong. I'm just think that they're really missing the one of the real causes or contributors to cardiovascular disease and death and disability in our modern world. So with iron, I will frequently find that men are iron overloaded. This is not, I mean, I don't even know what number to put on it. 25%, 30%. It varies a lot week to week, month to month in the practice, but I am regularly recommending that men go out and donate blood. Why? Because the worst thing that can happen when most men donate blood is that they will save somebody else's life. So why shouldn't we recommend that they do it? And if you go down this rabbit hole, you will find that many, many people have found that there is a substantial level of evidence suggesting that reducing a man's overall iron burden can have a powerful role in improving his health and actually uh, increasing his longevity. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that every man needs to go out and donate every two months like clockwork. 
but certainly for many men who are trying to overcome health problems and reclaim their health, this is super important. One of the reasons why I think it's so important for military first responders, veterans, et cetera, is that you guys are eating a high iron diet because you have to support a massive amount of muscle mass. You are often not being fed the best of food. Hello, MREs. And oftentimes when you get out or you are off the clock or whatever, you are also not eating that healthy of a diet. It is also, as I said before, a very high iron diet. I think there's a higher burden of these problems in those men. I also suspect that blood donation can help men to recover from heavy metal toxicity because that's one of the compartments in the body where these heavy metals are stored, but I don't have a ton of data on that to share with you. All I know is that I've had men, I mean, just change their health overnight by showing up at a blood donation center and dumping blood. Some of my happiest patients have been men. And one of the only things I found for them, not only, but one of the salient things I found for them was that they needed to dump blood, but it's often because they have a genetic predisposition to actually accumulating it. So on that note, take homes I want people to, to have from these, from this video. Okay. Toxins in the environment are a really big deal. Heavy metals are a really big deal. Getting rid of those heavy metals, sauna is one of the most important things that you can do in order to make this happen. And next, iron overload's real. It's grossly underappreciated and underdiagnosed. And even if I'm wrong in some way about it in general, I'm 100% sure that a huge proportion of men in my practice feel much better dumping blood. I'll make more content on that later. If you want more information on this, I'm going to include some of it anyway in my webinar on high blood pressure next week. And uh, that'll be, or no, wait, hang on. I think that's this weekend. It's going to be September. I think it's 23rd. It's the first link in my link tree. If you're interested in learning more about my thoughts on high blood pressure. So sauna gets rid of heavy metals, improves health. This is part of why I think it's such a big deal. You see in the hair, as I mentioned before, that the top third of men with or for mercury content have the highest risks of death. This is why I do hair tissue mineral analysis. This is why I'm so serious about balancing minerals and eliminating heavy metals in patients in my practice. If you'd like to become a patient, click on my link tree, schedule a consult. We look forward to taking care of you. As always, thanks for watching. Take care. Have a great day.